You know, um, you were just talking about the sun not shining and the clouds are there and the storms and my mind went to this great scripture which you probably, I think you'll know it. Some of you will know it. And it's this. Even though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. How many of you have been in that situation in your lives? How many of you are in it now? <laughs> he goes on to finish this. This is at the end of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Habakkuk, as Americans say it. Brits say Habakkuk. Can you all say Habakkuk? Habakkuk. Is that how you say it? Habakkuk? Or Habakkuk? <laughs> it doesn't matter, does it? This is how he finishes it. The sovereign Lord is my strength. There's your answer. It does not depend on you. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go to the heights. Even though there's nothing in your life that's working. This is the point. Nothing is working. He says, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And I promise you the answer is in your own heart and you're in your own tongue. It seriously is. As long as you keep saying please... You're not in faith. You start saying thank you. It's as simple as that. You say, come on, Andrew. Listen, I'm not lying to you. Why would I lie to you? I've lived long enough to know it doesn't work. (laughs) And I've got too much integrity to lie to you. Go from please to thank you. And stay in thank you. And once you've got to thank you, never go back to please. Make yourself a promise. I'm going to live in the thank you. That's what he says. There's nothing good going on in my life, and yet I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to continue to say thank you. Well, thank you, sir. We had a good day yesterday. I, I was woken by the wind at uh, about 5 o'clock in the morning yesterday in the hotel. And it was raging, and I thought... Somebody's going to have to have some faith around here. (laughs) And it turned out beautifully. I understand that Rachel is going to bribe Chrissy. Uh, She's going to pay her not to have an outdoor wedding. (laughs) Cheers, cheers. Oh, my gosh. Their faith has been tried and tested. Well... This is, this is the first month of 2020. And so forgive the uh, obvious, rather obvious play on words, but 2020 means you can see clearly now. Amen. I mean, 2020 vision apparently is as good as it gets. Amen. And uh, I had my eyes tested more and I had our eyes tested a couple of weeks ago. We were back in the States from Spain and we have a really, really good ophthalmologist who works in, works in Walmart. And she's absolutely world class. And uh, we had her eyes tested. And thanking God again, she said, my eyes are like the eyes of a young man. So he renews your strength or something, right? But 2020 vision is about as good as it gets. And, uh, and so I think that... Uh, I'm encouraging you in this next decade. And think how old you'll be in 10 years' time. No. (laughs) I'll be 85. I'll be 85. I wonder if I'll still be behind this pulpit. I aim to be. 
you know. Um, but it gives you, <laughs> it gives you cause for thought. Some of these young children, young ladies and gentlemen, will be married. Yes! <laughs> Some of you parents will have an empty nest. <laughs> and some yearning-hearted would-be grandmothers will have grandbabies. And perhaps some of us will have passed home to heaven. All of these things are very sobering thoughts. And uh, they're sobering but not sad. They're not sad. Because we have set our stall and set our mind to consistently rejoice in the Lord. Shekoba. No matter what happens, I will rejoice in the Lord. Though the fig tree does not blossom. So 2020, I can see clearly now. So I'm going to ask you to just, for a moment, uh, reflect on that. The things that are unresolved in your life right now. And some of us have got things that have not been resolved for quite a while. And we actually have not been able to find, in within ourselves, we have not been able to find an adequate answer. I want you to reflect on some of the issues in your life that are unresolved. And we're going to pause for a moment. I want you to think about them right now. In your mind, think about that person. Think about that situation you have not been able to conquer. Think about that relationship that has still not come right. <coughs> and we're going to, I want you to think about it right now and take a moment truly cognitively to allow God to look at that thing and to say <coughs> in this next year and this next decade for sure these unresolved issues in my life are being resolved now. Because it's time to see clearly. It's time to see through the fog. Take a moment. I'm going to wait just for a moment. We're going to pray together. In a holy moment. Father, we are your children. You are a great and good and loving Father. And truly, we don't know how we would live without you. But Father, every one of us is carrying stuff we find burdensome, we find on our minds. And Father, we bring those to you right now. We lay them down. Now let faith rise in your heart. You are the God. You are our Father. You know the end from the beginning. Father, I ask for relationships which are at this moment fractured and unresolved, I ask you to do your miracle of reconciliation. I ask you, Lord, for marriages that are teetering and wobbling and are looking with trepidation at the future. I ask you to move in with your grace and your compassion. and the wars, and the words. Father, the families that are broken and fractured, 
causing heartbreak. We ask you to heal them. We ask you that anger will be turned to joy. That dislike will turn to loving again. And that above all, people's lives will be blessed and be able to be fruitful and productive and that your kingdom will be extended and your beautiful great name will be glorified because we'll always give you the thanks for what you're doing for us. For financial situations that have not been resolved, we ask you to have mercy upon us. We will not be thoughtless, we will not be unwise with our money. But we ask you to bless us and resolve our financial issues. And we promise we'll do the right thing with the money. You're a good God. You're such a good God. And thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us. Thank you, Lord, when we blew it and we messed up. You didn't desert us. And thank you, Lord, that we sit here and I stand here today in our right minds. We give you all the thanks and praise. And Lord, for every situation that we shall face in this next decade. And there'll be so many. What happens, whatever happens in our great country of America and around the world, we do not know. But we ourselves resolve to promise you, we promise you, and we resolve absolutely that come what may, we will serve the Lord. In this house, we shall serve the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your love has won our hearts and we have nowhere else to go. We don't want to go anywhere else and we choose not to go anywhere else. We are yours and you are ours. And you're good. Now we give you thanks, Lord, that you've heard our prayers and we look for answers. Sheko patese, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Hmm? Shabu. What time is it? 11 o'clock? What time do we finish? Oh. There's my clock. I was looking for a clock there. It's not there. It's there. You moved it. I, I, uh, I had a, to bring the word, I had a, um, I mean, that was the word in one sense. I wanted to say 2020. Come on now, even if you can't see clearly now, say, I can see clearly now. <laughs> now I can see clearly. And I did want to bring, just briefly, a, uh, a challenge to all of us, myself included, and to all of us. Because over the Christmas period, I had this thought, uh, and it's, it's an old thought. I mean, I've always believed that I've been born again by the Word of God. You've often heard me preach, and you've pro I'm almost certain to have said that that we now live by the power of the same endless life that raised Christ from the dead. So the same, the same power that raised him from the dead brought us alive. I believe that. We believe that. But somehow it struck me as being even deeper than that. Now we're in somewhat of a mystery here, so forgive me. 
But when the Virgin Mary, who was probably anything, to be honest, from 16 to 18, 19 years of age, when she became pregnant by Holy Spirit, it is a mystery. And I hesitate when I talk like this because to some extent none of us knows what we're talking about. <laughs> we can only say that she became pregnant by God. It says the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and that which was born of her was of Holy Spirit. So clearly God came upon her And God, God demonstrated for us in that moment, he demonstrated his entire plan, which is that human and divine will work together in glorious partnership, undivided. So he entered humanity as humanity. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh. Now somehow, please don't, please don't, you know, write blogs and tweets about this because I'm just suggesting. I don't know how else to say it. Somehow the sperm of divinity collided with the egg of humanity and out came Jesus Christ. Amen. Now how else could I say it? I don't know. Somehow, somewhere in there, there's the truth. I'll be okay with that. But God and human produced Jesus Christ. Because God gestated in the womb of a woman for nine months. It wasn't so immaculate that suddenly, boom, there's a boy. He grew within her. And God demonstrated his divine purpose that it's always through humanity that he wants to achieve his divine purpose through you and me. Our objective in life isn't to get to a pension and to retire without worries. Our objective in life is to become God with skin on and actually live like Him. So that the world will know there is a God who loves them. Now in that kind of thinking, it hit my spirit that not just that I'm living now by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's true. I am. But something inside me has received by the same Holy Spirit the same word that caused Jesus Christ to actually become flesh and blood in Mary. It's the same seed. Luke 8, 11 tells us that the seed is the Word of God. The Word of God entered us. If you like, as the sperm of God. <laughs> and God entered humanity in Andrew Shearman. Come on, say it for yourself. God entered humanity in the name of... And God was born in you. You have been born again. Hallelujah. Come on. You now live, not the old life, the DNA has changed. That's right. That's right. It is now natural for us not to sin. When you're a sinner, you just sin. Don't blame sinners for sinning. That's what they do. And so did you, and you're pretty good at it. Come on. I've often told you, pigs grunt, ducks quack, and sin a sin. That's <laughs> what they do. Now then we say, oh, a terrible sinner. Don't blame them. You were just as bad. Amen. But now it's unnatural for me to sin. Now do Christians still sin? Yes, they do. But they've chosen to do it. Ooh. Not natural anymore. The seed has entered you. And Peter tells us, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says that we have been born again by an incorruptible seed. 
an incorruptible seed. It is going to be pure, it is pure, it was pure, it will be pure and incorruptible forever, he says in verse 25 of the same chapter. It's incorruptible forever. Not even you can corrupt it. <laughs> Not even you can corrupt it. It's incorruptible. <coughs> we are marching to a different drumbeat. Our eyes see things differently because our eyes have been enlightened and the eyes of our soul now see and the eyes of the spirit understand. This seed, it just, it just amazed me again that somehow it was the same seed. The Word became flesh in Mary and the Word became flesh in me and you. So you are no longer ever a victim. Well, what about the fig tree not blossoming? There's no sheep in the pen, there's no cattle, there's no oil in the ground, there's no jobs, there's no nothing. Yet will I rejoice. You say it's easy for you to talk like that. Hmm. I can remember Mo laying hands on the fridge and asking God to help us get some food. So we've all got our stories, haven't we? Absolutely. We've all got our stories. This is not bragging rights, my, you know, my story is better than your story. We've all got stories how God came through when we didn't have anything. I remember one day she was praying, Lord, let there be five pounds on the sidewalk when I go out. So she went outside the front door and there was five pounds on the floor outside the front door. Come on, Jesus. So we know, like it's not my first rodeo. I do have a few scars, but there's no point in comparing scars because yours might be bigger than mine. I don't know. I don't care. But we've all got some scars. Right. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord because there's somebody inside me that's bigger than the circumstance. There's somebody inside me that's bigger than every enemy that comes against me. And if I have to go into the lion's den and burn to death, I still will not bow to that dumb idol. Yes. I love him and I trust him and I'll rejoice until there's no breath left in this body. Amen. And the same will you. The seed. It's a beautiful thing. Now what I want to challenge us with in these last few minutes, because this applies to us all. <laughs> I am not the unique person in this church that Christ has come and invaded with his divine seed. He's invaded all of you. And the only one that can stop him growing into the full grown-up that he's supposed to be inside you is you. If you insist on keeping him a little baby inside you, then that's your fault, not mine. We go from glory to glory. What we should do. We're supposed to go from strength to strength. He should be growing at us. We should not be going around the same old mountain we were last year. <laughs> In fact, we should be still rising when Jesus either comes for us or we pass over. We shouldn't be rising plateau, fall and slip. We should be keeping on rising. We go from strength to strength, faith to faith, because he's growing inside us. Now, the only way he won't grow inside you is if you let infection damage the fetus. Or if you, having had the baby and you be all the baby, if you don't exercise. I have never ever once in my life seen a mother looking at her baby lying in the little crib in the cot and screaming at it, saying, Grow! What's the matter with you? Grow! <laughs> they don't do that, do they? What does a good mama and daughter do? Keep the baby clean. Feed it. Gets an infection, take the infection away. Keep it warm, and especially love that baby. And that baby, somehow teeth appear. Wow! Right? 
he get the point. But you didn't yell and scream at it, grow, 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 grow. Get rid of it, all the infection in your life. Come on, somebody. Yes. That little thing, we all got them. Get the victory over it. Say, help me, Jesus. Come on. Yes. Get rid of all infection. Somebody was just my sweet little sweet lady on the second row that asked me about my reading Bible, which is I'm, I'm doing the second year. It's my daily message. It's, it, it's the message version of the Bible. It's just set out every month, every day. And you read it. If you don't read it, you're on starvation diet. So don't blame me. You know? Keep the baby free from infection. Keep yourself free from infection. Keep yourself well fed. Keep yourself warm with affection. How do you do that? By giving affection. And remember you were born to be loved, so let God love you. And you'll grow. And then, <clears throat> I came across this well-known verse that you will remember, just as I'm going to finalize, because this is what I want to sort of prophesy to the church. This is what it says in John chapter 12. And before you go to the message version for me, uh, I want to read it in the NIV. This is what, you know the story. Jesus is predicting his death. And he says this, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a seed or a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's a hard verse. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. And my father will honor the one who serves me. And he's saying this in the context of the fact that he's going to die and he's asking, he said, now my heart is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So, Father, glorify your name. Now, this is, this, is, this, is, this is the application and this is the final outcome of that seed being implanted in you and growing into God Almighty, a divine invasion of humanity so that we can live, we can live with assets and we can live with with resources that people that don't know what it's like to be a Christ person, they don't have access to those resources. That's why in the face of the storm you can still rejoice. Because ultimately it's illogical madness. Unless there is a God who understands, unless there's a God who says, see that man down there in Thibodeau? Who shall I pick on? I could pick on pastor, of course, but I'll, let me pick on his wife. <laughs> See that woman, Rachel, down there? No matter what happens, she will never deny me. And God starts bragging on Rachel. Who to? To, to the enemy, to Satan. No matter what you throw at her, she won't deny me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Is that spirit in this room? <laughs> if I go down, the last thing will go down with my mouth uplifted, shouting, thank you, Jesus. Would it? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Are you living such a life that God can look down from heaven and tell Satan, see that servant of mine, I trust them absolutely. No matter what happens, no matter what gets thrown at them, they will always love me and trust me. 
That's because you've got an incorruptible seed inside you. Incorruptible means it will never die. It can't be mutated. It's whole and clean within itself. But then we come to this verse when Jesus says, I'm about to die. Shall I say, Father, don't do this to me? Can I do this some other way? He said, no. This is the reason we're here. This is why God and humanity have come together to save the world. So John chapter 12, in the message. Let me, let, let, let's put it up for us. John chapter 12. Verse 23 to 25. Are we there? The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Keep going. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat, a seed of wheat, is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it never it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. Now the next verse gives you the clue. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. This is what he means by, if you hate your life. You haven't got to hate yourself, that's, that's a ridiculous thing. It means your priorities are not yourself. It means that you are not the first person you think of taking care of in any situation. Oh. If you are prepared to die to your ego, die to your self-imaged status, But if you let the life that you know, let's see what it says. Anyone who holds on to life as it is will destroy that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love. You just sang about God's reckless love. Overwhelming, reckless love of God. Who did not keep his life as it was but voluntarily offered himself to death on our behalf, dying in the darkness of hell, dying, inverted commas, in the darkness of hell, so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And his life then wasn't just one person, Jesus Christ, but multiplied in millions of Jesus Christ's all over the planet. A hundred million of them at least in China. Hallelujah. Now my point is this, and our challenge is this. A seed that goes into the ground, the husk on it gets broken. The outer shell gets broken the protective thing you've built over your life gets broken. And it's buried in the darkness of the dirt and the soil. And you allow your self-imposed image of yourself to be broken. You allow yourself to be broken open so that you are no longer the priority of your own life. Because the essential characteristic of love is giving. And I'm on to prophesy. This church, and not just this church, but the church of Jesus Christ around the planet needs to grow. There is no magic wand, my friend. There's no publicity stunt. You won't find the answer by Googling it. The answer sits right here in this church right now. This is the promise that he tells us. If you let your life go, reckless, in your love for each other and for God. You'll have it forever. Real and eternal. And it will go on, it says, it will go on to produce many seeds. So I'm challenging us. 
The seed is in you. I'm talking about the next decade. I want you to think about it. Next decade. I was reading some, some sort of scientific prognostications, you know, some prophecies or ideas that might take place in the future. And they actually think that some of the young people living today will actually live to be 200. Could well be. The next 10 years are going to be unbelievable dramatic change. I mean, serious, serious stuff. <laughs> most of it, for somebody that's lived through a different generation and a different lifestyle, most of it's fairly scary to me. Very helpful. I mean, is it good to live more pain-free and to live longer lives? I think so, as long as they're productive. Yeah. What do I mean by productive? I mean turning people to Christ and, and spreading the kingdom of God across the planet. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Faith, hope, and love. My God. So the size of the slice of the pie that you have is entirely up to you. But if you keep your life as it is, you will lose it. But if you will let him have your life and let it be broken, let that kernel, that out protect him. Ooh. If you let it all go, we were singing it, right? Let it all go. Lay it all down. And let it all go. Be buried in the soil of humanity, in the love of God, and produce many seeds. Yes. Amen. So I'm prophesying that there are people in this church that love God enough to let it all go. Yeah. And many of you have done this, but there's another call. It's a call to my life too. I'm as old today as I've ever been. Wow. <laughs> Profound, eh? So are you. Uh, which means I've, you know, I'm fairly old. Ish. <laughs> Not young anymore. What shall I say? <laughs> but I've probably got more responsibility today than I've ever had. And I don't, if anybody wants to retire from what they're doing, oh, that's fine. But don't retire to go play golf. Go, play golf. If you do, at least walk around the course. But you know what I mean? Don't, don't like get to a point in life where you say, that's it, I'm done. There's always somebody you can invite around for tea or coffee. There's always somebody that needs a, a yard cutting. There's always that person that you really, that relative that has been so hard to deal with that it's worth driving a couple of hundred, three hundred, five hundred miles or getting a plane to go see it be okay. Said to my dad when he was, my dad died at 95. And I said to him when he was about <clears throat> 88, I think, he was, he was getting up. And I said, Dad, is there anybody in the world that I need to take you to see before you pass? Is there anybody that you need to forgive or they need to forgive you? And he, he went, hmm. Wow. He said, uh, you know, there isn't. I said, are your accounts clear? He said, yeah, my accounts are clear. So you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. So I, so I said to him, I said, Dad, well, why don't you just die and we'll bury you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we'd had, this, we'd had this thing, my dad, because my dad had always talked to me about guys in the Bible that, you know, they knew they were going to die and they put their feet on the bed and gave up the ghost and died. What a brilliant thing to do. I said, why don't you just bring your feet up on the couch and give up the ghost and die? <laughs> my point is, he was ready to go. There was nobody else left to see. Don't leave unresolved issues that you can resolve for yourself. And as you begin to resolve the ones that you can resolve, God will do the miracles for one that are outside of your remit.
But I'm begging you, this church will grow because you will lay down your life. Because you will lay down your life to serve somebody. You say that means people are going to, I've got to open my home and more people come into my home perhaps, probably. I've got to serve more meals, probably. I'm going to be tired late at night sometimes, absolutely. But he renews our strength. Sheko. So I was driving in England one day. Am I overtime or under time? Is it still going down? Am I overtime now? Oh shoot. Can I tell you one more story? <laughs> so I'm driving in England one day, July. It was a nice day. And the road was a little lower than the banks on the side of the thing. And I, uh, I'm driving along, because you're on the left-hand side of the road in England. So it doesn't, you're driving on the right-hand side of the car. And, I, and, the, and I'm, I'm alone, and the Lord says to me, what's that on the right? So I looked, and it was, it was a field. My eyes were level with the top of the crop. Uh, the Holy Spirit said to me, what's that? I said, it's a field. Now, what is it? I said, it's a field. So he said, well, he said, well what, what is it? I said, well, it, it's a field with, uh, you know, it's got those weeds. You know, weeds grow usually taller than the crop itself, and they go brown. I said, well, it's, it's got a crop in it with, with some, some weeds in it. So he said, well, what is it? I said, what's the crop? I said, it's wheat. So he said, well, what is it? It hit my spirit. I said, it's a wheat field. It's a wheat field. Now, of course, you're not getting my point here, I don't think, but yeah. my dear friends, it's a wheat field. Yeah. Thibodeau is a wheat field. Yeah. It's not a field of weeds. It's a field of wheat. Oh, it's a wheat field. Yeah. Your life is a wheat field. It's a wheat field. It's not full of weeds. It's a wheat field. Amen. Don't let the devil tell you that it's full of weeds. It's a wheat field. Hallelujah. People are ready to believe. People are ready to hear, have you love them. People are ready to see you heal them. People are ready to see you take their burden and carry it with them. Yeah. It's a wheat field. Come on, say it with me. It's a wheat field. Ha <laughs> ha. And I'm a seed of wheat in that wheat field and I'm going to produce many seeds. Because I'm not going to hang on to my life as it is right now. I am going to give it away. Come on. Amen. Would you like to stand with me as we close?